Andy. Hello, hello. hello. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Fantastic. It's, it's a little hot in here. But it is very humid in Louisiana, so welcome. Welcome. Well, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's a Saturday. I have to be happy. Uh, are you ready for your 73 questions? I am so ready. All right. Well, I think. Then you'll be all right. So let's get started. What is your name? My name is Sanjay Kumar Janeja, immortalized from Harold and Kumar, the movie. <laughs> and what's your specialty? I'm a hematologist and medical oncologist. And how many years have you been practicing? I've been practicing for three, almost three years now. Okay. And where did you go to undergrad? I went to undergrad at, I wish I could say, the Louisiana State University. Uh, and medical school? Medical school was also at uh, LSU Medical School in Shreveport, Louisiana. And residency? Residency was also at uh, LSU Shreveport um, in, sorry, was also at LSU in Shreveport, and my fellowship was also there at Weissweiler Cancer Center in Shreveport in hematology and medog. All right. Well, so I know it wasn't too long ago, but do you remember what your favorite part of medical school was? I think my favorite part of medical school, and it sounds kind of silly, but it's the first time that things are really new, new. So... At first, when you don't think the first two years of the, you know, the sciences and the microbiology matter that much, it's amazing how your library of knowledge on that stuff comes back later at times you would never think. Like in oncology, we're going to get to it. But all of that stuff is all of a sudden relevant. And then in third and fourth year, too, to be able to see, it's like you're there. Like that moment or feeling of like being there as a professional that you've probably thought about forever happens. And that only happens once. So that's something you really want to kind of, you know, uh, latch on to and enjoy. Absolutely. So I know a lot of people come into medical school wanting to do something specific. So what specialty did you think you were going to go into on your first day of med school? So interestingly enough, I always wanted to be a teacher. Um, I loved my middle school science teacher and that was kind of my plan until I got into a bad car accident and lost my eyesight for quite a while and didn't know if I'd get it back. And then I realized that a lot of teaching in the process of what was wrong with my eye and the pressure that was behind it and me trying to get it down and why I'm doing the eye drops, et cetera, et cetera, made something really scary a little less scary. And it kind of guided me in the process. So I changed gears, kind of realizing that doctor traditionally does mean teacher, like in Latin. And that's where, that's why PhDs were the first doctors. And so I was like, I can still do the teaching, but help people kind of get the gift of sight. So I went to uh, medical school originally with that idea of being an ophthalmologist. So what made you change your mind about that? So I think, to be frankly honest, and if you're an ophthalmologist, I'm sorry, I just, the, it was very difficult for me to, um, one, really just to be in an OR. Like, I love the surgical part of it, but not having the autonomy to, like, I don't know, scratch my nose when I want to itch it. I actually say itch my nose, which isn't even the correct term, so I'm not smart enough to be a surgeon. And then also uh, was, was, it was, it was all one organ. I really like to kind of think about the human physiology as a whole. Gotcha. So were there any specialties you immediately said, out the gate, not for me? I think anything, again, that involved like prolonged periods of time, I, w I just wish I was cooler. But it was hard for me, like with the OR, to just, to, the discipline is so, um, is so remarkable. So I admired that a lot. And then other than that, I can't say that there was uh, a specialty that I wasn't somewhat interested in or if there was a big need for it where somebody said, Sanjay, we need you to be, you know, a neurologist or OBGYN or PEDS, I think I would be, uh, I would find some value and fulfillment kind of regardless. It's a humbling field in general. So, well, let's get to what you are passionate about and what you built your medical career on. So what first made you fall in love with Hemonc? Oof. Okay. We're gonna, if it's okay, come in for this one. Absolutely. Um, it's quite a humid day, as we mentioned. So the thing about oncology is I, one second, sorry. The thing, sorry, the thing about oncology that made me really realize that the, to the teaching element that that was the most important thing was it's really scary, right? Everyone has that kind of fear of having the cancer term, um, whether you have it, and especially when you're diagnosed with it or if you have a family member, something so intimidating can be really scary. And just like how I had lost my eyesight and, you know, I could have, I think, in retrospect, been more scared. I wasn't because I just had my goal. Like, what is the next goal? Why can't I see? Why, why is my vision either blurry or, or, or not there? Why does it hurt so much? And when you break these things down, I've learned very humbly that um, 
people can accomplish and wrap their heads around pretty much anything, right? We hear horrific stories about what happens like in other parts of the world and when it comes to you know, violence and, and plague and lack of resources. People are inherently like extremely capable. But I think the thing that makes it most challenging is if you don't know what you're in for. How do you, how do you wield yourself with the ability to do it? And that's where I thought cancer was so um, important to be able to help guys do something so scary. What is happening? What is cancer? Why is it behaving this way? What are the expectations? And so all of that kind of threw that together on saying, hey, I can teach, I can help people, I enjoy teaching, and hopefully make something, you know, scary a little less scary. Yeah. And you want some water? Absolutely. Thank you. Of course. This, it is hot. It so. is hot. We're going to keep saying it. So I'm sure that response probably resonates with a ton of future Hemonc docs. So for those interested, how long does your training take after med school? So it takes a good while, um, I guess depending. It's six years total. So you have to go into internal medicine first, and it is extremely important. I can't conceive a day that you don't need internal medicine because obviously you can have cancer in any part of the body, but the medications and treatments are just very, um, they can affect all kinds of things. They're getting more idiosyncratic uh, and nuanced. And I think if you enjoy the whole body, which is kind of what I alluded to, I know the eye has everything to do with the whole body too, like hypertension, you know, diabetes, it really does. But, but it's something that you need internal medicine for. So I would suggest to you to make sure that you love it, right? Because you end up having to write for hypertension meds and everything for some of the treatments. All that to say, sorry, that's three years. And then three years afterwards is hematology and medical oncology. It's two different uh, specialties and two different boards eventually. And then after those six years after med school, um, you're good to go. But you can also specialize in like BMT, for example, bone marrow transplant. And there's some certain subspecialties you can do outside of it. So did you ever consider getting other degrees like an MBA or an MPH? I did it at first. I think it's really important. We get into this track of like, I gotta do this, I need to do this, I need to like really beef up my you know, CV or whatever it is. But you really do find your place with the elements that come with practicing. So it's so important to like do something you're, you're passionate about. That's your safest backbone. But then after that, um, you know, now I'm realizing like where something like that really may fit because I really enjoy like advocacy, uh, when it comes to, not enjoy, I think I feel purpose to help in equity and advocacy when it comes to democratizing care, making sure it's, you know, kind of equal in community America, if you will. Yeah. So, do you mind if I make coffee? Of course. I mean, no, go ahead. As in, I understand the drive for coffee. There we go. I'm sure you do. I'm actually. an absolute coffee fiend, so I'm well, kind of jealous of your espresso setup, not going to lie. So, there's a lot of benefits on Fido, the, 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 uh, phenols in coffee. It's actually studies have shown it's protective. If everyone's listening and they're like, I gotta cut down on my coffee use, granted, it's also a complex of decaffeinated, but it helps high blood pressure, all cause mortality, even cardiac related stuff if you have three to five, I think it was three to four cups of coffee a day. But sorry, I digress. Shout out to all my coffee lovers. There you go. So now, what would you say is the most unique part of your specialty? The most unique part of my specialty, I would say you know, and I'm saying this not knowing the other specialties, but really it's the relationships and how important the relationships and understanding your patients and the dynamics on how they need to hear something as well as their family members. And then contrasting the personalities differently in the room that may need to be heard one way by your patient, but a different way by their spouse. That is a, an incredibly important variable to practice that, uh, that I think maybe people don't necessarily have to keep, be so keen on when it, when it comes to other subspecialties. But again, that's me being obviously biased. Excuse me one second, this is gonna make a really loud noise. Do you want okay. some? Sure. All right. Love it. Um, so, of course. Wow, that's Sorry. loud. So loud, let me go over here with you. <laughs> it's okay. So, with any specialty, I always like them to try to sell it. So why should someone go into your specialty? I think for the reason to kind of quote unquote sell the specialty, number one, it's something like you have to gravitate for. I think there's a uh, really cool thing that happens when you meet with people that are in cancer, whether it's a nurse, nurse practitioner, whoever is in that field, 
um, there's something that's like inherently uh, a calling, I believe. But the thing that's the most rewarding, or really, I don't even know if the word is rewarding, but it's so humbling, is you were seeing the reality of like true threaten, you know, threatening to mortality. And it's oftentimes at a place that nobody's prepared for it, right? Much like trauma, but unlike a trauma center, it's something that's kind of more long-term. And so it's a very humbling field where problems that, you know, may have been problems for you or stressors, it's really hard to feel like those are real problems or stressors when you are, um, you know, having a full day as an oncologist. You get home, you see your children, you saw children earlier, you know, that, that of your patients or whatnot. And it, 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 for that reason, when people say, oh, it's difficult, it's hard, it's just humbling, and it makes you kinder, it makes you more tolerant, you see the stress that a spouse is going through, and, and sometimes it gets displaced, right? Like it's maybe like anger or kind of shortness, and that's made, you know, it brings a lot of grace when you may be treated that way in a you know, grocery store or whatever. You just, you just, you're constantly reminded, like, of the finiteness of life, and it's very humbling for that reason. But again, in my opinion, like I'm saying, so flip it around, play devil's advocate. Why should someone not choose your specialty? Ooh, I think there's two predominant reasons. If you don't mind, I gotta get my favorite mug, which I'll be able to show you here in a second too. Sure. Um, I think number one, it takes a colossal amount, and I didn't appreciate how important this was. It takes a colossal amount of keeping up on things. Um, and there's a colossal amount of like guilt and almost like stress of, am I keeping up with it enough? Um, because it's so rapid. So you have got to be a lover of constantly re-edifying yourself and constantly like database searching. It's, it's extraordinarily rapid. So that becomes difficult. It's actually impossible to keep up on all the data with if you're a generally, general community oncologist because you're not gonna be the breast specialist and the GBM and the liver specialist. So you have to be okay with feeling to some degree incompetent or behind for the rest of your career. And the second part of that is, that's as a, as a community oncologist. And the second part of that, I think it is to, um, you know, if you are compassion-based, so I'm gonna dip into my office here for a second. Wait, what? I know, I know, is so that, sorry. It's, you know, uh, professional in the front, business in the back. Oh my God. It's so obnoxious, a little over the top, I know. That's why I keep it hidden. But I'm a Gemini, you know, the two little, like, personalities, so it's, it's something that, that my, it's, my wife said I have one space to be able to kind of just have it my own, so this is where we ended up, I know. I know. It's, 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 it's obnoxious, but I love it. It's my personality thrown almost emesis into one room. <laughs> um, yeah, and the second part of that would be just like, it's hard to shut off. You know, you think about your patients, you could always read more, kind of to piggyback the first um, thing that I was saying. And, you know, even on the weekends, if you have free time, you're thinking about that, that 40 year old or that 35 year old, and you know that the response in, it hasn't been great in the first two recommended lines, and you, you can scour the earth and find something if you look like, if there's something to find, it takes scouring to find it, and you have to have that pressure that, that doesn't shut off, you know. So, are there any stereotypes about your specialty? Um, I think there are different flavors, which I actually don't like to use that word, but everyone's heard it if they've been to med school, right, from our senior attending. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of, of the things that people think about oncologists are, number one, and this one really kind of hurts my feelings, like, that the care or delivery of medications or therapies have to do something with the actual, you know, payment or repayment and stuff. I learned very quickly, I gotta show the mug real quick. One of my patients got me that. And well, one of my patient's daughters, and my patient was nervous because she's like, what if he gets offended? Other doctors Ooh, wait. and me. Let's get this in focus. Maybe, yes, you got no. it. Wait. Maybe. Is it gonna focus? There we go. So yeah, I thought that was fun. Um, and you have to have fun, and that's one of the cool things about oncology. But, but yeah, I would say some of it is like how, you know, there's this thought that compensation correlates with, you know, the treatments you're giving or, and things like that. You know, I know you know there's just so much cancer and people are waiting to see a doctor. So that one just hurts my feelings as far as that kind of bias. And I would say that's the predominant one. Um, 
the other one is that we are considered very fixative and like, you know, just obsessive to detail, this, that, and the other, and I would say that's kind of accurate. Yeah. So, with any stage of medical training, from a third year to, or third year medical student to even a second year resident, there's this concept of on the spot testing of knowledge known as pimping. So what is the craziest question you've ever been asked by an attending? Oof, the craziest question? I would have to say the craziest question that I was asked was, did you look at the calluses of their feet when I was asked a question about back pain? And I said, no, sir, I checked for the spinal stuff, did the you know toe touching. And he had shared with me that one of the most telling things that you could see, especially on the description of the back pain, is where are the calluses on the feet to see if it's what's called an intalgic gait, where you're basically doing something to hurt, and you can kind of get an idea of what's being tweaked. But more importantly, in this patient, because of the calluses, you could tell that there was a leg length discrepancy because one foot was slightly shorter than the other, and because of that, where you saw the friction was, and one foot had significant more uh, callusing than the other due to the friction, we were able to put in like a half an inch or an inch insert into all of the shoes, and it really made a big difference in the patient that was fairly young, about, I think, 38 years old. And so, you know, to think that I did at first, did you look, or why should you look for calluses on a foot for back pain, again, sometimes seems like so random, but was a, was a very, would have never gotten to the conclusion, but was a very good one. Well, you know, you taught me something today. There you go. Yeah. All right, so back to kind of like your lifestyle and important stuff. What does an average day for you look like? An average day is going to be, as an oncologist, of course, we have children, and so there's all kinds of stuff in the mix. But generally, your clinic starts around 8 or 8.15, and you're going to see patients through probably about 4 or 5 o'clock. And... For that reason, what happens is, in a lot of settings, you have your patients that are admitted in the hospital. So you need to go up to the hospital first to see your admitted patients between maybe 7, 8 to 8 a.m. And you kind of do your rounds um, and make sure they're tucked in and doing well. Then you go to clinic and then see your treatment patients from 8 to noon because the treatments can take three, four, or five hours. And obviously a clinic or an outpatient setting is usually closed up right by 5 or 5.30. So you need to see all your treatments first in the morning, and then that leaves room for shorter treatments like IV iron and new patients in the afternoon. And then you get consults through the day on patients that are coming in with a new blood or cancer problem. So you usually have to see them after your clinic and kind of put in your recommendations, et cetera. Um, and that is the bulk of it. I will say it's very important to realize this. Your patients have schedules like every two to three weeks, right, of treatment for their cancer. And so it makes traveling um, and kind of taking time off very, very derailing because you need an oncologist to, if you want to leave for a week, which my wife and I, she's also an oncologist, haven't done you know, to this day, Monday through Friday, who's going to see all five of those days worth of, or four days if you have an admin day, patients from the morning to the afternoon? It, it becomes challenging. That's something that I would never thought of going into oncology. So do you enjoy the inpatient or outpatient side of things more? I think definitely the outpatient. I was very close to doing critical care for the same reason of like human physiology and dynamics and how all this is symbiotic and ties in together. But the biggest difference was having difficult conversations and making difficult decisions collaboratively and not knowing the patient and their family as well, right? Like they're strangers. And in oncology, you're making decisions, hopefully having a really good idea of where their heart is. Sometimes the patient isn't saying what they may want to say because they are doing something for their spouse. The spouse wants them to keep on fighting. And having all that kind of awareness um, is, is something that uh, is only developed over time. And so that, for that reason, I love the outpatient setting and getting to know the families, their names, and, and really intrinsically like who and what they are. Gotcha. So what's the most amount of patients you've seen in a day? Probably... Close to 23, if I had to guess, 24. Mind you, you know, the lengths of conversations are often longer because you're explaining a new cancer or in the mornings you're basically telling someone sometimes that they had a progression. So what was routine, right, is week 23 uh, of their treatment uh, or 24th cycle. It's a 15-minute visit. And then you have this news, though, to say, hey, I think you've progressed. And it kind of really changes everything up. Uh, that is something else to really think about with oncology um, because you, you – can't plan for it. 
I mean, I forgot the question, but uh, but that is what takes a good period of time, 23 patients. And then you see the patients in the morning and the uh, evening that are admitted. So I think that would be closer to 33 patients yeah. a day. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple friends who are actually interested in hemonc, and a lot of them are planning on taking either research years. I know one of them uh, just got accepted to a research year at, uh, with the NIH. So is there any research as with part of I guess your practice and your job? Yeah, so I'm really passionate about this because as I had mentioned before, like everything is blowing up with cancer, right? In the sense of treatment wise, sorry, uh, that phrasing is very important. Um, the treatments are really coming out in super high volume. How do you know what is a relevant thing to target, right, in a cancer? So like triple negative breast cancer versus triple positive. Those are talking about receptors. HER2 positive was one of the most aggressive features of a breast cancer that you wish you never had. And now all of a sudden, like, it's, we can get on top of it very quickly. Why? Because we can attack that receptor. So research means what are all the other receptors in all the other cancers? Do we have treatments that work? And so it is absolute, like, like, you know, top priority and importance to have research. And there's two different kinds. And that's what people don't realize. And I think even on the med student level, there is research that is done in a lab on drug development and like mice and all this stuff. And then there's clinical research, which is the smart people did all that stuff, already made it, already kind of got past and seeing that it's, you know, safe and tolerated in humans. Then the clinical research is get your patient on that trial. And a lot of times it's with what we already use for that uh, cancer type, it's often at an adjunct. So anyone listening to this that's like, hey, research, just realize those are two very different, ugh, that word, flavors of, of research because um, it's very important and you'll see it pretty much and you really should or better have it, you know, available to you in any cancer setting. So what is the youngest patient you've ever taken care of? The youngest patient I've ever taken care of is um, uh, probably, I guess 18, 18 or 19, because we have, you know, we're adult medicine. So some people can do what's called uh, a med eds oncology, but the treatment regim regimens are very different in pediatric populations and adult populations. So I think most people stay on one side of the line. And for that reason, I don't really see anyone kind of beyond um, or below the age of 18. What's the oldest? The oldest I have currently a 98 year old that I'm very determined to get to, um, you know, to the centurion mark. And he has cancer. And that's the beauty again of cancer is there's targeted therapies now and immunotherapies that are so tolerable that it's not that chemo that quote unquote blows someone away. So he's like a year and a half in right now to a metastatic cancer, but doing really well. Um, so 98 is the oldest one I have currently, and I don't think I've cared for one over 100 years. I did one time at the VA. The VA, I, I uh, used to practice there. It was, uh, he was, I believe, 102. Whew. So what is one thing people misunderstand about the field of hemonc? I think something that's misunderstood, at least on a non-medical side, is that there is progress to be had or made. Like a statement of this cancer is very difficult to treat or that, you know, this, nothing can be done in this setting, that question has to be reset pretty often. Um, and people are trying. I think that's a big one. It's like, is, is there's this thought that there's this acceptance that cancer be, can't be cured or whatever else, and it's just not true. And I think in medicine, one of the biggest uh, misunderstood things by other specialties is really to what a high degree, number one, we know our patients, but number two, and this is a big issue to be honest, people assume that somebody with a bunch of cancer is like, oh, they're just a f one foot in the grave. I know that sounds harsh, but it's just, it couldn't be more wrong in the era that we live today. Like, if you don't know what that cancer is, it doesn't matter if it's in 50 spots and all this stuff, if they're 90 pounds, you don't know what the prognosis is unless you know what it is and what treatments we have. Because people like melanoma stage four, for example, uh, small cell lung cancer with platinum therapy. But melanoma is a big one where people just, can, it can melt away for years and years and years and has a 40% chance of responding to first-line therapy, immunotherapy. So you have to know what the cancer is um, before you can make a conclusion. Now that's different than somebody that's on a fourth or fifth line therapy because now you can say, 
the best things in this in this cancer type and treatment have been exhausted. That's a whole different conversa conversation than a brand new diagnosis. So what would you say is the toughest part of your job? I think the toughest part of the job is definitely giving bad news. You never perfect it, um, or maybe you do. I don't know. Like I just don't know. One of my staff told me, you'll never know how you did. There's no feedback when you give bad news, especially like the end of the road news. But he said, if I've learned one thing, it's if somebody tells you thank you after you've given really bad news, that's the, that's the best determinant he's recognized in his career to say, you've got to understand that person and that person's family. Yeah. So what would you say is the most rewarding part of your job? The most rewarding is celebrating the victories. It doesn't matter if somebody is, you know, quote unquote incurable or, or what we call terminal, but if they have a response, like you have got to highlight and make a big deal of the victories because they are very big deals. And those tears that we share all the time and everything, that's, I mean, there's no feeling like it. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Sure. So how many hours do you work in an average week? Probably about 50. Okay. What time do you normally wake up? Usually no later than 6.30. What time do you normally leave the hospital? Probably not till about 6 p.m. Yeah. How many hours of sleep are you typically working on? So some of it is because of things that are outside of practice, kids and, and other things I'm passionate about, but uh, usually about five to six, which is very unhealthy and not okay, just so anyone listening knows that. How many hours of sleep are you working on right now? Uh, probably about the same, it's seven days a week. Sure. Do you have to take call? Yes, you usually take call. Uh, you rotate in an outpatient setting with your, uh, you know, cancer team or, or partners. So when you take call, at least here and in the previous practice I had, it's all weekend, just the patient phone calls, the admissions, uh, the rounding, that's all part of it. And then you take day calls overnight as well. Are you a night or day person? Um, I think definitely I get some of my best personal work done at night, but then the patient care and, and just the feeling of a morning. We have another morning you know, in this world. That is something that I really value in the daytime practice. Sure. Now, this is a very important question that a lot of people forget about. How long does it take for you to chart at the end of your day? It, hours. Uh, just literally, is, and it's not quantifiable. I mean, it is. I, there's so much to be done in the healthcare system, and basically if they show up to any center and it's not in your note, my fear is the person won't know what's going on. So it takes just hours. It's endless. My wife and I are working on notes. That's our time together. It's like when the kids are down at 8 p.m. till about 10, 30, 11 p.m. is just writing notes, and that's seven days a week. That's why I asked the question. So, more wholesome one, who are you most thankful for on your care team? I would have to say uh, it's definitely my nurse. She is somebody that shows a lot of compassion for the patients like I do, um, and even more, I would say, because she feels the calls. And having a good team, especially in an outpatient setting like that, literally will make the difference on like the level of reward you have, the level of burnout you experience or feel. There's no compensation enough of like compassion and wanting the other person to have like, like the best experience of their work. So like whether you're the physician, whether you're the nurse, it's invaluable and it's something that should be of very high importance if you are thinking about being a medicine specialty. So what's the most common medical advice you give to your patients? I think the most common medical advice I would give, and I don't know if it is even considered uh, medical, but it's def definitely to celebrate the victories. And it, 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 whatever it is, if there's pain relief for you know something, or if there's a good response to the scan, even tolerating the first treatment, that is a victory. And I think, not I think, the data shows happiness in general correlates with better outcomes in pretty much all different respects of, of medicine. So that would be my, I think my biggest advice as well as like give yourself grace. So like don't do anything to an extreme. Like don't cut out, you know, fats and don't never eat unhealthy. If some patients love alcohol in the South. I say give yourself the grace to have it in moderation. And because again, we just know in this field, you just never know when life, you know, throws you a curveball that you may not be able to overcome ultimately. Sure. And now what has been the most impactful patient encounter? I think the most impactful patient encounter I've had It has to be when, oh, there's so many. I'll tell you one story quickly. And it's basically, I had a patient, maybe 100 pounds, but apparently they were like this all the time. This was years ago. And she 
I had a very aggressive cancer. And for whatever reason, it was so aggressive that the first line therapy, the second line therapy, the third line therapy, just, it would not, it just bounced off. And she would ask me, and she'd ask me after the first time, um, when I told her that she had, you know, progressed on the first line, but you're saying I can still buy green bananas. And I was like, I'm sorry. And she was like, green bananas? And I was like, oh, I don't understand. And she was like, that means that I still have enough time to be able to have them ripen on my counter so I can eat them. And so I was like, yes, ma'am, you can still like buy green bananas. And then I remember after the fourth line, you know, I had to tell her or she had asked, I don't remember, it's so heavy, but like it, it's, you know, we don't have green banana time anymore. And I think it was a very interesting way to think about something. Every time I see a green banana, I think of her. Um, and that was very impactful as well as a, a gentleman, this was years back as well in his 40s he was very sick with a very aggressive cancer it was towards the end and he was in you know in an icu with beeping monitors this and that and i told him you know it's time i think to that, that we're at the end of the road here and etc and he said okay he's like well i just he said some very thoughtful words and how much he appreciated it and then he said you know i'm going to miss all this and he did that in a room that's beeping and icu and ivs and um and i was like it took me a second but he just when I made that face, he said, you know, by this, I mean, he's like, just life, air, the day, mornings. And that moment, um, it just, it, it humbled me a lot, you know, to, again, to realize how fortunate any of us are, you know, for the most part, when it comes to things like that. Whoa, now I need something yes, else. To say. I'm all getting choky. Well, you know, that's a good time because, you know, we've talked a ton about your life inside the hospital. So, we go and move on to what happens when you clock out. So what is your favorite thing to do when you are not working? When I'm not working, I don't know if it counts, but I think I really, do you mind if I have a seat again? Go for it. Um, I think my favorite thing, I probably need to check my calluses to see if there's a little leg length because <laughs> of my back pain. Um, the thing that I enjoy most is by far playing with my kids. Like, I, it's so easy to be thinking about other things while you are um, at home and stressing about, you know, work and your patients. I try to be as present as possible. And they're like seven, five, and two. And to remember what the world looks like through their eyes and their lenses, that's some of the most palliative, like, you know, therapeutic things I experience. And I encourage anyone, whether it's your nephew or your cousin, the world looks different out of their eyeballs with their like younger brains and ours are matured and you can't go backwards. So I think it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. How many kids do you have? Three. Okay. Uh, and does your family ever ask you for random medical advice? All the time. All the time. What's the weirdest question you've ever been asked? Oof. I think the weirdest question I've ever been asked, I would say it's, it's, it's a bag and it's my family friends really or friends and it's just pictures of the most or a description of the most intimate area of something that's just very benign seeming and they're like kidney speed cancer and I'm like how long has it been there it's like seven years and but I just noticed it so it, those are always I think uh to me you know stranger questions but but there's no strange questions either right yeah it's always the derm pictures it's always, always. the derm yeah so now do you have any pets I have one dog Baxter he, it was it was received by a uh patient in my third year of medical school. He, she just casually mentioned, yeah, we got a bunch of dogs, wiener dogs, and, and I was told it was a mini, but apparently they only meant mini uh, because they were a puppy, because he's like 35 pounds. <laughs> he's walking around here somewhere. That's right. So, now, favorite animal, not a dog or a cat? I would have to say it's a horse. I hear that they're very empathetic, and I love that a lot of inmates and people with like mental health disorders and, and, and struggles apparently see a lot of palliation. And so I always wondered what is it about the temperament of a horse that can somehow, you know, placate people, uh, you know, in their emotions. If you could have dinner with anyone in history, who would it be? Goodness. Anyone in history, I think it would have to be Aristotle. That was a philosophy. I studied philosophy in undergrad and, and he, he was, he was just on the forefront of so many different things, and to get inside of his head or even try would be something truly remarkable, I think. What would you guys be eating at said dinner? Oof, with Aristotle, Indian food, of course. He has to know what it is. So, what's your favorite dish to eat? Um, my favorite dish is probably, uh, so I just classic, but it's going to be just like um, 
uh, tiki masala at an Indian at an Indian restaurant. Any good restaurants around here? I mean, we're so in New Orleans. Many. Yes, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Southern Louisiana. There's so many. And if you like French Creole, Cajun stuff, it's here. Okay. Coffee, tea, or soda? Coffee. How much water should you be drinking every day? I love asking this question because everybody gives me a different answer. Should? I have no idea because I don't drink any and it's terrible. And I can tell you that drinking water is important. I would guess maybe 68 ounces. Favorite meal from the hospital cafeteria if you have one? Oh, gosh. Uh, my wife and I in residency ate a lot of the cheeseburgers. There was just something, some novelty about it. And you got to make it how you wanted. And it was on a grill. <laughs> so, top three music albums. Oof, I think it would be Michael Jackson's um, The Thriller. It would be, believe it or not, Dave Brubeck. Um, I think it's called Takeout. Uh, it's the one with um, Blue Ronda Leturk. Blue Ronda Leturk. And then also Lil Wayne's um, Underground album, No Ceilings, I believe, the third. That's a spread, and I'm here for it. <laughs> so, favorite song at the moment? Favorite song at the moment would have to be um, uh, Stay by uh, uh, Bieber, I think. It's just something that's in Disney movies, and my kids love it. And every time it comes on, we just start dancing our best dance. <laughs> Pineapple and pizza, yes or no? No. Okay, good. So, any artistic hobbies you keep up with? Artistic, probably just uh, photography. I used to do that um, back in med school, and I really enjoy kind of getting to dissociate and do that uh, outside of medicine. Favorite movie or TV show? Oh my goodness, these are hard. Uh, these are the hard ones? What's that? These, these are, are the hard, hard ones. ones. Favorite TV show would have to be, um, I, I, I just can't answer. I'm a Netflix kind of junkie while I'm reading my notes. It would have to be something that has to do with, uh, like maybe Mindhunter is a pretty good one. Okay. So one random task you wish you could be better at? One random task that I wish I could be better at would be writing down the things that I had to do. Um, a task of tasks, if you will. I just, and for some reason, stubbornly keeping it in my head. So, what's the best way that you relax after a long day? Uh, I'd have to say again, playing with my kids. There's nothing that, that is more palliating for me personally than that. Night in or go out on the town kind of person? Oh, definitely go out in the town. I think there's, yeah, that's an easy one. Indoors or outdoors? Outdoors. Beach or mountains? Oh, I hate the beach, personally. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of insult for that, but dirty, hot, and sandy. <laughs> so would you consider yourself more of an introvert or extrovert? I would say extrovert. Do you think that personality trait was a factor in you choosing your specialty? I think so. I think that you definitely have to have a sense of people and communication for oncology. All right. So we're getting close to the end. And as we wrap up, of course, I like to conclude with a few reflective questions for those out there wanting to be in your shoes one day. So first one, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up as a kid? I think what I thought I wanted to be when I grew up, you know, and this is not how you mean it, but even when I was 12 or 13, I was like, I want to be a father. I, was, I just always wanted to help counsel. And so for whatever reason, I always thought it was more important to be what you want in a role-driven uh, capacity. And then your profession is another piece, right? But professionally, I think it was definitely like an NB, or sorry, soccer uh, athlete, like, you know, FIFA. Like every every other kid. Right, right, especially of, you know, Asian descent. Yeah. So is there a different specialty you think you could have done? I think I could have done um, several different specialties. Anything that had to do with, like, relationships, I would have liked to be still uh, internist or, or primary care to just help someone have their healthiest life. And I would have liked to do, believe it or not, uh, interventional radiology. You could treat a lot of cancers and stuff and do very life-saving techniques um, in that capacity that is pretty techie. Sure. If you didn't do medicine, what do you think you'd be doing right now? Oof. If I didn't do medicine, I think what I would be doing is trying to still bridge or bring technology or capacities to community America and still a medical space. Um, I think there's a lot of underserved 
I mean, most, right, American community settings uh, don't receive the same care as an academic center. And I think if there was some creative way, whether it's with technology or advocacy, it would be in that capacity. Okay. Now, everyone knows the path to being a doctor is never easy. So were there any times that you doubted you would make it as a physician? Oh my gosh, absolutely. My first year, I was sure that I, um, that I just would not make it through med school. It was very hard. Uh, as everyone says, you kind of got away with being at the top, you know, and with, with less effort, I would say. And then with more effort, I still was not my first year and second year. Um, so yes, it is so normal. I think you're doing something wrong if you don't feel that way, actually. Now, if you could change one thing about the medical field right now, what would it be? For the medical field, I would love to see way more symbiosis between like administrators and physicians and everyone else in healthcare that's like non-physicians in any capacity. It is getting so disjointed that I think it's causing a lot of stress um, and lack of understanding by the parts that are so important to be an integral process. Yeah. Now, what can a medical student do right now to prepare to go into your specialty? I think for sure you need to have an interest in oncology in the sense of doing something, whether it's um, research or trial stuff. It's less important really in medical school for getting in because you can do a lot of that stuff in your residency with internal medicine. But if you're thinking about it, be the best internist you can be. That was one piece of advice I got from somebody I looked up to that was a third year. They said, Sanjay, you want to do hemonc, right? I said, yep. They said, so what are you going to study you know, through residency? Because everyone's going to come to you saying you want to do hemonc. I said, hemonc. And he said, absolutely not. He's like, you're not going to know any hemonc, and you're going to be the best internist you can be by knowing everything else really well. And that was by far the best advice I got. Because sure enough, in fellowship, I learned hemonc well, but I got to preserve a lot of my internal medicine side by not focusing on it too early. And that goes for any subspecialty of medicine. Now, if you're to go back, would you change any of your experiences that got you to where you are right now? I love the way you phrased that question. Uh, a lot of times people just say, what's your one regret or biggest regret, regret or do over? And this isn't a corny answer that's like, oh, everything. But truly, if you look at your life, pull yourself out macroscopically and say, am I, do I feel fortunate or gra grateful for where I am? For whatever the pieces are, for me, my wife, my kids, my career, if the answer is yes, the way I see it is, like, I wouldn't want to do over anything else because there's definitely been hard times and bad times and things that seem like mistakes that made me not make the same mistake. And that is the one rule I mentor everyone about, like with med students, residents, you name it. Permit yourself the grace to forgive yourself for the first time for anything. Give yourself the, like, discipline and that, that you expunge yourself from that, that, that guilt or that keep thinking about why didn't I. But just tell yourself you'll never make that mistake again. And if you can do that, then I think that is the most productive and constructive way to do anything. Very well said. Now, we're here. Question 73. Ready? I think I am. Finally. I <laughs> what would you say to the aspiring hemonc position right now? I would say if you are considering doing hematology oncology, there's a reason for that. Um, it is a field that is just not for everybody. And if you have that, uh, I believe there's a purpose in the world. The world wills a purpose for all of us, but you have to channel it and be open to it. And if you're thinking about it, I think it's a powerful thing in and of itself. Make sure that's the case. Ex if you, you know, expose and saturate yourself in that world, but be grateful because if you have that interest, that in and of itself, I think is one of the the biggest blessings or or something that's telling you that you belong in this field and it's a very you know i think privileged one to be able to care for someone some, with something so scary but also to already know or suspect that is very meaningful in my opinion and i can tell you that from being on this side of things oh very very well said that's all i got for you so thank you so much for your time sanjay and I mean, I'm sure you're inspiring tons and tons of hemonc doctors oh. all around the world. I'm very humbled, and thank you, Andy. You are amazing. Anna Virgo, I knew it. <laughs> thank you.